typically bleeding to death. We have information about two different vehicles, one a motorcycle, one a pickup truck. But an apparent abduction raises the stakes even higher. The people in the pickup scooped up a small boy. The child's safety is everything. He is volatile, he is dangerous, he is instinctually assaulted. Then, there's more to a murder suspect's motive than meets the eye. We thought that the things that he said Jim did didn't happen, that he only imagined that. He is claiming self-defense. Maybe that's true and maybe it isn't. Lots of things potentially come into play when humans interact. These things are very quick. Seconds are involved. Not minutes, not hours, none of that. It's right now, up close and nasty. There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. It's a warm summer evening in Colorado Springs. Patrons of a watering hole known as the Bank Shot are making the most of happy hour. You guys ready for another round? No, we're good for now, thank you. The Bank Shot was a local bar on the north end of Colorado Springs. It was your typical Wednesday early evening. It was happy hour. People were stopping by for a drink after work. Hey, you taking advantage of that weather? We sure are. Nice. Well, enjoy it, because that snow will be here before you know it. Don't remind me. <laughs> Paul! Paul! Need some help out here. Something's happened in the parking lot. Oh, my God! The bartender sees that it's his friend lying there, practically bleeding to death. Uh, Mike! Don't be okay. Don't be okay. Go, go call an ambulance! Stay with me. You gotta stay with me, Mike. town, Lieutenant Joe Kenda is getting ready to call it a day. Yeah, I'm just finishing with a few things. I uh, should be out here any minute now. My wife was making dinner for the entire family. Danny, leave your sister alone. Sounds like you got your hands full there. Uh, I need you to come relieve me. All right, well, I should be there in about... Okay. Joe? Hello? I'm sorry, Kath, though. They need me to see him. Kiss the kids goodnight for me, will you? I will. Okay, I love you. Love you too. Lieutenant, how are you doing? So what do we got? Victim's a 39-year-old male by the name of Michael Drake. Stabbed once in the chest. EMTs rushed him off to the hospital. When you receive a stab wound in the chest, there is a great possibility vital organs are involved. There's a further great possibility internal bleeding is involved. Paramedics say he had a radic heartbeat and shallow breathing. He's in critical condition. Okay, so this is where medical bottom is. Yes, sir. The crime scene is denoted only by a very small amount of blood. Not unusual in a stab wound when only one wound apparently is inflicted. There was no other physical evidence at the scene. There was no weapon found. outside between the victim and some bar patients may have escalated. Michael Drake got into some altercation with some biker type guys. The biker guys kind of follow him out like maybe this isn't over. Another witness reported that after the stabbing, three men fled the scene. Two men in a black pickup with Arizona plates, the other on a motorcycle. Okay. If a suspect is on a motorcycle, the pursuit of him is very, very difficult. A motorcycle, they can go places that I can't go in a police cruiser. 
and they're very hard to catch. Apparently, the people in the pickup scooped up a small boy, maybe around six years old, took him with him in the truck. Any time a child is involved in the possession of a suspect who is trying to escape custody, it makes it enormously more dangerous and enormously more difficult. The child's safety is everything. Children are innocent. Adults are not. All right. Make sure all available patrol units are out looking for that truck. Yes, sir. As officers fan out across the city in search of the suspects, Kenda begins interviewing witnesses. Hey, how you doing? Michael gonna make it? We don't know that just yet. I hope he pulls through. Can't imagine this place without him. Mike Drake was just a hard-working guy. He was sort of a freelance mover when moving companies would have trucks coming in and out of town. And they'd hire him. He was a regular at the bar and hadn't caused any problems or anything like that. The Broncos make three Super Bowls in four years is crazy enough as it is. Ain't going nowhere this year. It's the law of averages. I cannot wait to tell you. I told you so when Elway's throwing touchdowns in late January. <laughs> what can you tell about the stabbing itself? Uh, we believe that there were three people involved. Is that true? I, I don't know, man. I was in here behind the bar. But uh, a little earlier, I didn't see Mike get in. Guy. They said there was an exchange of heated words and profanity between our victim and the rider on the motorcycle, and that his two companions are not involved in that altercation. I couldn't tell what they were shouting about, but after a couple of minutes, it seemed like they were making peace. Maybe it went on out there in the parking lot. I don't know. Bikers are always looking for a reason to fight. So this group of three guys, were they a member of any club? Maybe the Sons of Silence? other than the Sons of Sun. We had many confrontations with them over the years, in every business you can imagine, and they like to have their own area, and they don't like it to be interfered with. That's where most of the trouble begins. We get SOS bikers in here all the time, and they weren't part of that. You know, I've never seen these guys before. So were these guys alone? Uh, was there anyone else with them? Actually, they were with a woman, but she cleared out well before any of it. Chaos. So, where is this woman? It would certainly be nice to have her, since we don't know who she is, and we don't know who any of these people are, at least not yet. Oh, I appreciate that. Hey, uh, you might want to talk to Scott outside. He was out there when it all broke down. Thank you. You got a witness named Scott out here? Yeah, right there. Scott Carver. So it's my understanding that you saw the whole thing out here. Yeah, kind of. I was on my way back from uh, buying a pack of smokes. That's when I came up on these two guys, and they were out in the parking lot just pushing and shoving and really about to get into it. Scott Cardinal presents as a witness to the actual event. Hey, hey why don't you try taking some of my money and see what happens? Look, I told you five times already. I didn't take it. You got no f respect. Hey, look, man, I don't want no trouble. Is it too late for that Oh. He sees he has a knife. He tossed the knife, and that's when he took off on his bike. What about the two friends? One of his buddies ran over and grabbed the knife. That's when the two guys grabbed the little boy, and they just hauled ass in the same direction of the bike. I mean, I got part of the plate number. I gave it to one of your officers, but quite honestly, I think they're long gone. We'll see about that. One thing a motorcycle cannot do is outrun Motorola. They cannot run a police radio. They can disappear in short order, but they can't continue to be disappeared. It's a matter of time before we have these two. Searching for the individual on the motorcycle and his companions in a truck. Oh They're involved in a stabbing incident in a biker bar. There's also a female who was with this group. We're very interested in finding her. 
Thankfully, the search for the mystery woman is short-lived. So I return to my office. Lieutenant, this is Margie Daniels. She showed up shortly after you left. We figured that you'd want to talk to her. She's upset. Margie Daniels is the mother of the child who's with these people. So tell me what happened. Well, I came back to the bar and the place was calling the cops. My son Hunter was missing along with the guys I went there with. So you know the men that were involved in the fight? Yes, one of them is my brother. So it turns out that Margie Daniels and this child are related to the motorcyclist. She says that's her brother, and his name is Gene Pack. But everybody knows him as Pac-Man. Now, what about the other two guys you were with? Steve and John, they're friends of ours. She describes the other two individuals and names them as friends of her brother. Okay, so who brought you to the bank shot? Are you regulars there? No, actually, we're from Arizona. We are on our way home, coming back from the rally up in Sturgis. Margie Daniels explains they'd been to Sturgis and the Dakotas for the Harley-Davidson rally. They'd been there for a week. Sturgis can have as many as 500,000 people show up. It is a huge thing. You have people that go there that just want to party and have a good time, and you get people that go there that want to party and find trouble. Is your brother's friends uh, affiliated with any bike club or gang? Well, we've been driving all day, and we were tired, and we decided to stop and get a drink and just relax for a couple hours. She says they're not familiar with the Springs, but they know a biker bar when they see one. So then we go in there, and my brother Gene starts arguing with this guy. About what? I don't know. I, I wasn't paying attention. You're so close. I didn't get to do it. Stop bothering me. Your uncle Gene's half drunk, and he's about to start leaving. What are you talking about? Get out of my face. She's concerned because she knows her brother is extremely hot-headed and he's much worse when he drinks. So she's worried this is going to be bad. Steve, go over oh. there and get him out of there. What kind of a <laughs> takes money to get him out of there? Get, get out of my face. face. What'd you do with it? Get off of me, man. Hey, man, listen to your buddy. I got no beef with you. Come on, bro. Whatever. Give me another beer. At this point, Gene is now calm. The bar patron is calm. He goes back to his drink. Gene goes back to his. And Margie says she's relieved. And she walks out of the bar and goes and buys her merchandise. And then I came back, and that's when the cops told me a guy had been stabbed. I had a bad feeling my brother was involved. Her story matches very nicely to everything the witnesses say. There were two arguments. The first argument got settled, the second argument didn't. But she wasn't present for the second argument. I didn't think he'd ever stab somebody like that. But sometimes when he gets a few drinks in him, his temper can get pretty out of control. The more I learn about Pack, my concern is he is volatile, he is dangerous, he is instinctually assaultive, and he may not survive a felony stop. Listen, I love my brother, but at this point I just want my son back. I don't want anything bad to happen to him. She knows that he's with Steve and John, but she doesn't know where they are. Okay. You feel the same way. The officer will take you to the lobby. You can wait there and let you know when we find out. Okay. Thank you. And if we recover this kid, we want to be able to give him to his mother. So she waits. As Kenda considers his next move, he receives word from officers in the field. It's Kenda. Sir, we have eyes on our suspect on uh, I-25. Are you sure it's him? No doubt. They're saying he's got long hair with Arizona plates. Officer Spitzmiller is in pursuit. Okay, go ahead and make the arrest. 10-4. Officer Spitzmiller will pick a place that's advantageous to him to conduct this felony stop on the motorcycle, hoping that the suspect will contingency plan in place just in case... He decides he's going to flee officers. He just stabbed somebody. He's going to be hyped up. So they have to take that into consideration. Eventually, he stops. He doesn't run. Shut off the bike! 
assumption is he is armed and therefore dangerous. Mark that thing, get off of it! The officers got a 12 gauge shotgun with shells of double hot buckshot. If they are used, the person on the receiving end will be dead. Shut it off! Do it now! Golly stops are very serious, huh? So we shall see how this ends up. If these people are willing to stab someone in the parking lot of a bar, what else are they willing to do? stabbing at a biker bar. We have information about who perpetrated this crime. Two different vehicles, one a motorcycle, one a pickup truck. As a result of our pursuit on the interstate highway, we have now found the driver of the motorcycle. Shut it off! Shut the bike off! Turn it off now! of the theft of money. We would 
love to be able to talk to Michael Drake, but we know that he's in critical, unstable condition. Hey, Doc. How's he doing? Mr. Drake's going said the knife wound missed his heart by a quarter of an inch. A quarter of an inch to the right, and he would have been dead. He's recovering and alert, so you can talk to him, but keep it short, please. Right, we will. Thank you. Good. Mr. Drake, I'm Lieutenant Kendall. Uh, how you doing? I've been better. Can you tell us what happened? Still a little hazy, but I can remember most of the details. I was in there sitting at the bar having a drink, and there was this uh, kid who kept trying to get the bartender's attention. to play a machine in the bar. He has five nickels, but he doesn't have a quarter. Okay, let me see what I got. <laughs> oh, here you go, buddy. Here you go, I'll trade you a quarter for your five nickels. Mr. Craig takes the five nickels, but maybe the kid doesn't understand. Now he has one coin and he had five. One replacing five, that doesn't make a lot of sense in a kid's mind. So it's confusing to him. I thought I was doing the kid a favor.
Coming up, a violent shooting leaves Kenda questioning the killer's state of mind. Was he having a psychotic episode when the shooting took place? Was he out of contact with reality? That's what we're here to find out. started to slip. Next thing you know, I'm on my back staring up at the rafters. But the bull, he kept bucking. And his hooves kept getting closer and closer to my face. Unbelievable. Yeah. Most police officers I know have some passion outside of the job. I like to play golf. Larry Martin likes to play golf as well, but he's also an avid bull rider. Sit down on a bull in a shoot and, and you're getting prepared for that ride. The uh, cases that you've been working on, you're not thinking of any of those. You're just thinking about that ride that's about to happen. Anyway, the rodeo clown wouldn't have distracted him. He would have crushed my head like a melon. So that's how you like to spend your free time, getting trampled by a 2,000-pound bull. You should give it a try sometime. Hey, I'll even lend you a pair of chaps. I'll pass, thanks. <laughs> we were just having a, a fun time. And all of a sudden, Joe's pager goes off. See you, Joe. All right, I'm out of here. Okay, good luck, buddy. Thanks. Hey, I'll be here. All right. I am told there's a shooting on Mountain View Lane. When I arrive at this complex, Detective Walker is already on the scene. Hey, Walker. That's what we got. Victim is 39-year-old Jim Ross. The paramedics say he took eight or nine bullets, so not surprising he didn't make it. He was announced DOA at the hospital. Jim was a very nice, kind man, very helpful, would help anybody that he could. He had several bullet holes in his body, and where he was hit, he would have definitely went down on two or three shots. Any witnesses? Yeah, his roommate, the, uh, Dennis Michaels, he called 911, okay? And he confessed to being a shooter. Problem uh, is, he claims it was self-defense. I'm not so sure. If you are the person responsible for ending someone's days, the first thing you're going to think of to say to the police when they arrive is, I had no choice. It was self-defense. What's this say happened? He says that the victim came at him with a knife inside their apartment. Problem is, we can't find any evidence of knife. I asked Walker, have you looked? Oh, we've looked. We've looked in the parking lot. We've looked in the apartment. And several officers have assisted him in the search. So where's the shooter now? Sent him to the hospital with another officer. When you arrived, I was about to call the station, do a background check on the guy. Okay, why don't you go ahead and do that? I'm going to meet me inside the apartment. You got it. When I walk up into the crime scene itself, I see a serious blood stain on the balcony. This is the location where the victim was found. Hey, Lieutenant. Good. Good. How many shell cases did they find in the parking lot? About 15. It's obviously clear that Dennis Michaels was serious about putting Jim Ross down for the count. And everything started in there? Yes, sir. I'll be there. Yes, sir. When someone's got the blood stain, so we know Ross has been drinking. rifle laying on the floor in the apartment and it has a 30 round extended magazine there is a leather sheath to a knife also laying on the floor containing no knife this sheath is 10 inches long whatever knife is in there is an impressive blade we don't know where the knife is correct no sir but we're still looking. Hey, Lieutenant. Got some information on our shooter, Dennis Michaels. He was working at the Air Force Academy, former Army. He was recently let go for medical reasons. Dennis worked for the Air Force Academy as a maintenance worker 
Medical reasons? Anything specific? Don't know. We can find out in the morning when someone gets into the office. You said you sent him to the hospital for some tests. So see what he has to say. How you doing? Yes, sir. So uh, what are the doctors saying? Are there any signs of trauma or injury on Dennis's back? I just spoke to the doctor a few minutes ago. There's nothing on him. He's clean as a whistle. Blood alcohol test isn't back yet, but he seems pretty coherent to me. I want to see what he has to say about all this. When we walk in this room, I'm hoping to get a read on Mr. Michaels. Mr. Michaels, we're the Colorado Springs Police Department. Uh, it's been explained to us that you claim self-defense in the shooting of Jim Ross. We just have a few questions about your account. Like what? When we see him, he's calm and quiet. He's not showing any emotion. He's giving very little away. Like what happened to the knife that your friend supposedly threatened you with? I just, I, I, I got rid of it. I don't know where it went. You're going to have to be a little more specific than that. What'd you do with the knife? You know what? I think I want a lawyer. All right. That's your choice. But you're not going home. I said you are in custody by your own admission. You have killed Mr. Jim Ross. And we are going to determine the nature of that event. Call your attorney when we arrive at the next building. Well, let me ask you a question. When we get back to the station, would you be willing to take a polygraph test? I have no faith in the scientific nature of polygraph. What I do have faith in is human reaction to the question, but has a technical aspect to it in terms of me getting a drift of his truthfulness. It would just be about your initial statements to the police, and that's it. What do you think? I I'd be fine with that as long as my lawyer can be there. All right, good. We'll see you there. He was acting in his own defense. Make sure you bring him to us as soon as he's released. Yes, sir. The following morning, Kenda and Dennis Michaels' attorney observe while the polygraph technician administers the test. Are you sitting in a chair? Yes. Did you confront the guy you shot? No. Have you ever driven over the posted speed limit? schizophrenia. Well, well, that certainly changes things, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Schizophrenia is a very severe mental illness. It can have symptoms of anything from having delusions and hallucinations to an inability to think in a logical and coherent way. If it's treated, its symptoms can fall away. If it's not treated, its symptoms can become very severe. Well, Dennis's mental state raises questions. 
the detectives soon discover that their victim had his own set of problems. And there's something else. It's in your office. Come take a look. So what's this? It's a digging in the Jim Ross's background. Turns out he has a record. Some domestic violence with his ex-wife, Bobby. This wasn't a box. Some evidence when he was arrested got this from the storage locker, including this. He pulls out a plastic bag containing a Bowie knife. Now that knife's way too big to fit the empty sheets we found at the apartment. Yeah, I know. We also found an address for his ex-wife. Might be worth checking out and see what we can find out about him. Yeah, let's do that. If Ross had one knife, maybe Dennis wasn't imagining anything after all. Knives are scary things. And the one in this bag is enough to cut your head off with. What else does he have? Jim and I had an on-again, off-again relationship, but we would always stayed pretty close. My mom and him divorced, but they still kept a really good, close relationship with each other. That's just the type of person that my mom was, and that's the type of person that Jim was. How about his relationship with Dennis? They were roommates, right? Yeah, and they were good friends, but they had their problems. They had a strained relationship, but this? Bobby says that Dennis had told him he wanted his stuff out of the apartment by the end of the month. We understand there was a domestic violence incident not too long ago. What exactly happened? Jim got really upset and started screaming at me. He did have that abusive side to him unfortunately when he drank too much what did you say to me she said he had a habit of throwing a sheath off the knife and it give a flick of his wrist and expose the blood okay i'll go back to the store right now and get you whatever you want just put down the knife do you know if he had any other knives besides that one well i know he bought another one after the Police confiscated his, but I told him I didn't want it in the house anymore. What did he end up doing with it? I think he kept it at Dennis's apartment. So there is more evidence that Dennis may have killed Jim in self-defense now. We're very sorry for your loss. Thank you. We'll let ourselves out. The self-defense makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah, but we already searched that apartment top to bottom. We looked outside the surrounding area is nothing maybe we'll have better luck in the daylight and that knife's the key to this whole case so we go back to the apartment on mount view lane all right gentlemen i want you to cover every inch of that ground i want that knife Michaels picks up a rifle. He 
he is retreating from the presence of Mr. Ross, who is advancing toward him. I mean it. Put it down, please. You wanted me out. You want me to live on the street. You know, friend, you're son of a bitch. Stop the damn night, damn you. And then he starts blasting. Mr. Ross until he collapses and dies. It is a classic case of self-defense. In the military, you are trained to not assume the enemy is dead because you have shot him. So he grabs that knife and tosses it. And because of the emotion... Why did you make me do it, Jim? in a violent way like that it puts you in shock he did have that bad side of him about his alcohol he just unfortunately had a few downfalls and it got the best of him as for dennis michaels a psychiatric evaluation determines his history of schizophrenia played no part in what happened okay mr michaels we've reviewed the case we're dropping all the charges <sighs> thank you the district attorney the prosecutor jurisdiction elected not to pursue criminal charges and entered a finding of self-defense. Good luck. There are occasions when your technique of threatening people encounters exactly the wrong guy. Mr. Ross found that out. He threatened Mr. Michaels and died for it. It's deadly. He received a single gunshot wound to the right side of the neck. It causes blood to literally pour from him. As investigators search for the truth, they uncover a shocking secret. I was so naive to it back then, I was really not aware. Lieutenant Kenda and his team soon find themselves in a dangerous game of cat and mouse. We don't know if somebody's taunting us. A killer on the run never a good thing. We put somebody in a position of pressure because they will surrender what they know. They won't do it because it's the right thing. They'll do it to protect themselves. Pressure is what works. There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. It's a sweltering summer night. But patrons at the Baja Lounge aren't in a hurry to head home just yet. Yo, white cushion on my hand. Yeah. If you really want to talk to her, buy us both a drink. It was basically closing time at the bar. People want to get their last drink in before they head out the door. And that's what 26-year-old Montez Davis was doing. Thank you. and starts to turn, somebody pushes her. Hey! Oh. She thinks he's just a noxious drunk. Hey! Hey! Oh. Are you all right? Not right? When she starts to realize there's now a pool of blood starting to develop around him. Buddy, are you, are you okay? Ah! Hey. Y'all think he's been shot?
wife could sleep through World War III wouldn't know about it until she read it in the papers. But I'm a light sleeper, and I hear the sound of faint sirens in the distance. And I thought, well, they're playing my song. It's Canada. And a few minutes later, the phone rang, and I knew who it was. The Baja Lounge again? There has been a shooting at the Baja Lounge on East Fonda Boulevard. No one was surprised by that. This particular location was rampant with shootings and confrontations and fights. On the way. Bye. Twenty minutes later, Ken pulls up to a chaotic scene. There is people screaming obscenities at the police. Everybody drunk. The police are trying to bring some order to disorder. And your immediate thought is, it's going to be a long night. Hey, Lieutenant. Hey, Brian. That's what we got. Typical night at the Baja Lounge. Yeah. Victim still inside? No. He was transported to the hospital, and he got pronounced DOA. Do we know who he is? Our victim was identified. 31-year-old black male by the name of Douglas Warren. He received a single gunshot wound to the right side of the neck. Any idea what happened here? Not exactly. Uh, we can probably rule out a robbery motive, still have his wallet, his valuables. We're still trying to interview witnesses. You want to go inside, take a look around. I'll see if we have anything new. I'll come find you. And good luck with that. Thanks. While Ritz tries to rein in the bedlam in the parking lot, adventures inside the Baja Lounge. There's a large amount of blood, so he is bleeding freely, which generally means he has some arterial damage. That bullet has struck something like the subclavian artery, probably, under the collarbone. It causes blood to literally pour from him. We haven't found anything to indicate any kind of struggle on the inside. The blood is smeared from where the ambulance crew moved him to put him on a gurney, so the scene where the body is found isn't going to tell us much. But we the blood trail coming toward it because we understand the directional nature of blood drops. So Kenda decides to follow the blood evidence to see where it originates. We follow that blood trail from the doorway back out into the parking lot to where it begins. And this must be where the victim was hit. Yes, sir. He took that gunshot wound outside the building and died inside the building. We're looking around this blood trail origin point, and there's a one expended 25 caliber casing. Yes, sir. Been up and down the parking lot several times, only found the one. Looks like our shooter got lucky. What's unusual is this victim appeared to be only shot once. It's usually either a spray and pray where they just keep pulling the trigger until they hit something, or they're really wanting to get somebody and they shoot them multiple times. shot that is fatal is extremely rare. But here we are. Douglas Warren has found the magic bullet, and has found it in his neck. Now let's make sure we get that to the lab base. Yes, sir. Expended casings are unique to the firearm from which they came, so it's very significant evidence. Well, that was fun. Did you find anything? Yeah, more than one of them talked about seeing a white four-door sedan flee the scene, being the first to go. That's significant. Shots fired, and they immediately split. We have a little something, but a little is better than nothing. Gentlemen, gather around. All right, listen up. I'm ready to canvas all the apartments and businesses in the four-block area. We're looking for a white four-door sedan that was seen leaving the area. All right, we'll take care of Based on my own experience, the likelihood of this white car being involved in us is extremely high. You run away immediately because you are guilty of something. While Patrol keeps an eye out for the vehicle in question, 
Kenda and Ritz head to the hospital's morgue. We want to go to the autopsy to see what Douglas Warren's body can tell us about how he died. Hey, Doc. Hey, Lieutenant. How you doing? Detective. So, uh, what do we got? So, we got an entry wound to his neck. Went at a downward angle. The bullet severed his subclavian artery. And it didn't stop there. The coroner explains it also goes through both lungs. So, this 25 caliber bullet is in for the grand tour. It just punch a hole in his neck. It punches a hole in everything in his torso. There's your bullet. It is a deformed hollow point 25 caliber slug. So now we have an expanded casing and we also have a weekend find a gun. Hey, we found something else that you should see. Another one? No. The coroner explains that when they undressed the body and removed valuables from the pockets of the blue worn by Mr. Warren. They find a plastic bag containing what is believed to be crack cocaine and a small crack pipe. Here we go. Thank you. Thanks. Be careful, man. He's carrying drugs. Why is he shot? Undoubtedly because he's a doper. This case just got enormously more complicated. shooting death of 31 year old Douglas Warren. We have a suspicious car seen leaving the area and an expended casing from what is likely to be the murder weapon. But what really gets my attention, the coroner has found drugs in his Now we need to find everything we can about our victim. Does he owe people? Is he a player? The next best step is to contact his family. Down the hallway, the detectives find Douglas Warren's wife, Penny. What's going on? Nobody will tell me what happened. Penny Warren is wearing a security officer's uniform, and she explains that she received the call that her husband had been wounded, and she left work immediately. And so I raced home, and I was all scared because I asked my sister Betty, I was like, what happened? And she tried to tell me, but her husband told me instead that he was shot and killed, and I kind of just fell down the wall at that point. We're very sorry. This, of course, is horrible news. We give her time as best we can. We ask her to tell us about Douglas. What am I going to tell our kids? They have children? Yeah. Five. They were her kids from another relationship, but he treated them as his own. Now we have five fatherless children involved. He loves those kids more than anything. They love their daddy. They were always playing and joking around and, come on, Dad, let's go do this. Unfortunately, there's been some issues between him and me. Our marriage right now, it's, it's less than perfect. But we're working it out, you know, we're working things out. She goes on to explain that he had recently moved out and is not living with her. Still on good terms. We just, we couldn't live together anymore, you know? You always, of course, immediately wonder, are drugs the reason? But we didn't bring it up. We wanted to see if she would, and she did not. When's the last time you saw Douglas? Uh, earlier tonight. He came by with his cousin, Tony. Him and Tony, they worked together. He did. Lawn care. He worked hard. He is a good provider. He, he was very good at that. There you go. Take my cut. Thanks, bud. Every time he got paid, I would get his check, except for $20. And everything else went to me to pay the bills. You doing okay? Me? Yeah, I'm good. Don't worry about him. I'm going to take him out tonight, keep an eye on him. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Be careful. I will. Tell the kids I'll see them in a few days, and I love them. Will do. Let's go. I'm hungry. <laughs> I think we're going to want to talk to his cousin, Tony. Do you have his contact information? Yeah, but, but I don't think Tony would ever have anything to do with Douglas's death. Well, maybe not, but we need to explore all possibilities. Can we get that number from you? Yeah, it's 524.
So now we have a place to go. We have Tony, the co-worker and cousin. How you doing? I'm Lieutenant Kenda. Detective Ritz. They didn't have to shoot him like that. Well, Tony, who are they? So you were with him last night at the Baja Lounge. Yeah, we went to blow up a little steam, you know? Tony explains that they decided they were just going to get together after work and have a few drinks. Can you tell us a little bit about his state of mind last night? What do you mean? I mean, was he in a clear state of mind? You mean, was he on drugs? No, man, listen. Douglas was a user, but he'd been trying to quit and turn his life around, you know? That's why I left him, because I found out he was smoking crack, and I, I couldn't have that. I just... I was so naive to it back then, I was really not aware. But he was telling me he was over it and trying to clean up his act for his family. Even last night, he was behaving himself. Hey man, lighten up. I'm trying, I just feel terrible about the way hey they went down with Penny, you know? Yo, I can help you out. Tony indicated that when they first arrived at the Baja Lounge and were walking through the parking lot, several people came up and, and offered to sell him drugs. Nah, I don't think so. Come on. I'm sure it was tempting. I don't know. I wasn't even there when it went down. I left around 10 to go see my girl. And when I came back, the cops were already there. Is your girlfriend aware by this? Yeah, man. I'll give you her number. Just write it down for us. Man. There were three of the people there that saw me, too. Listening to Tony, he wasn't even aware that his cousin Douglas had any drugs on him. And he wasn't even at Baja Lounge to see what transpired in the parking lot. I hope you get that guy. My man didn't deserve this. Thanks for your help. Thank you. Unfortunately, he doesn't know much about the actual facts of the event itself. But he's not a suspect in this matter. Dispatch to Kinda. This is the same type of car that left the parking lot before anybody else did. The same type of car that I thought could be the key to this case. 10-4, we're on the way. Uh, go ahead and dispatch a couple extra units to meet us there. 10-4. It is kind of a neighborhood when you respond to what you think may be a suspect vehicle. We'll have enough troops on hand in case we need them. In a situation like this, you want to approach it as quickly as you can, uh, find out who this person is, what's he doing there. But in this particular case, as the officers were approaching the car, the uh, gentleman got out and started to walk away. Stop right there. Hey, let me talk to you. What's going on? What'd I do? I didn't say you did anything, but your car matches the description of the car that was used in the shooting last night. Oh, oh I don't know anything about any shooting. Okay. Through the driver's side window, a patrol officer sees something that gives them probable cause to search the vehicle. Got a gun. Damn. Come on, this now. way, right here. Put your hands on the car. Thank you. Put on the hood. Spread. You got anything on you? Nope. We say, put your hands on the front fender of that car, feet back, and spread them. And he does it. It's not loaded. It's interesting because this gun was wrapped in a t-shirt. Like it's going to either be a quick disposal or he's wiping it clean. We don't know. So it's something we definitely are interested in. Go ahead and detain him. I need to speak to him. Jan's behind your back. Oh, man. So we got a guy in a car, just like the one seen leaving immediately after a shot is fired, and he has a gun. The question then is, has he used it? Did he use it to put a hole in Douglas Warren? Investigating the shooting death of Douglas Warren, we have found a small white four-door car. We've removed the driver from the vehicle, and inside the car is a gun. Could this be our shooter? Of course it could. 
Sir, you need to step out. I need to ask you a few questions. Yeah, well, I'd like to know what's going on. Can you tell us your name? Darren Richards. Can you run this place for us? Yes, sir. We called him the dispatch. We're going to run this guy for warrants. See if he's wanted anywhere. Darren, where were you last night? Last night, I was out in a friend's house playing cars. And he provides that. So he has an explanation as to his whereabouts so we can check out. Hey, that record's clean. No arrests or anything. Yeah, I can tell you that. It's also not the murder weapon. That's a 9 millimeter. That's the wrong caliber, wrong size, wrong everything. We're looking for a 25 automatic, not a 9 millimeter automatic. So it's the right car, and he's in the right area, and he's got a gun in the car, but he's got the wrong gun. You got that gun registered? Yeah, papers in the car. You want to look into that? If it all checks out, you can go ahead and cut him loose. Will do. Sir, I'm very sorry for the inconvenience. Yeah. With his latest lead up in smoke, Kenda turns to another division for help. Metro Vice Narcotics is particularly useful in any case involving drugs. No matter how small or how great, they have a wealth of information about the drug world. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing well. So we're working on this case we really could use your help on. Okay, what do you need? They have people that they make arrests on that are willing to give information. A lot of people, when they get in trouble, are willing to deal out whatever they possibly can to save their own hide. So it's important that we see if have anything that might help us. So our best guess is that it all stems from a drug-related conflict in the uh, Baja Lounge parking lot. You know, just yesterday, we picked up a guy for a drug distribution. I was told he won't shut up uh, about a shooting at a club. You want to talk to him? Yeah, absolutely. I'll take care of that for you. I appreciate it. All right, you're welcome. As Kenda and Ritz enter the interrogation room, they size up the informant, Corey Brown. So we go into these interviews kind of open-minded we're hoping for the best and sometimes we get nothing so what do you got for us so that dude he got popped for ripping off a dealer curry says douglas warren was involved in a drug rip in the baja lounge parking lot was he with anybody when it happened nah he's just by himself warren's cousin tony told us they turned down drugs in the parking lot when they left the club to go see his girlfriend tell us what happened that he tried to snag a bag of dope right out of a dealer's hands. Douglas Warren had drugs in his pocket. Did he steal the drugs and die for it as a result? So do you know who shot him? No, I don't know that. But I know where the drugs came from. All right. Who? China Doll. I know China Doll. China Doll is only 18 years old, going on 35. She's a girl but innocent she is not i heard that she was down there with some of her people trying to make some cash china doll is a player in the street drug world small time no large amounts of drugs enough to survive do you know where we can find her all i got is her page number tell you what Corey, maybe we can work out some sort of a deal here okay wh whatever you want you help us land china doll and uh, i'll talk to some of our guys in vice and see what they can do about current drug judge. When we say page her, when she calls you, you need to buy some dope from her. Set up a buy. We'll be there out of sight, and when she shows, we'll snatch her. I work for you? Yeah, yeah, uh, I can do that. This is exactly what Corey's looking for, a break. We're going to give him one. In return, he's going to give us China Doll. Corey contacts China Doll and sets up the transaction for the following evening. In the meantime, Kenda and Rick prep him for the buy. I'm not feeling so good about this. She has agreed to sell them. He says he wants $40 worth of rock, which is two rocks. Don't you worry. We're going to be able to hear everything. In a buy situation, you put a wire on the informant. He makes contact, and as soon as the money's presented and the drugs come out, then we apprehend. Ain't she going to know I set her up, though? Nope. Because we're going to bust you, too. But wait, what? Hold still. We handcuff both. We put them both in custody. We separate them, the difference being we keep one and we throw the other fish back in the pond. A couple hours later, Kenda and his team wait in the shadows for their target to appear. Everyone stay on your toes, we're going to have to move in very quick. China Doll has been known to carry a gun in the past, so you prepare for that. Everybody's wearing a vest. You are never certain when gunfire might begin. There's also the chance that China Doll simply won't show.
lo and behold, much to our pleasure, not only does China Doll show up, but she shows up in a small white four-door car. All right, everyone, wait for my orders. Hey, China. Hey, I got you two rocks. You got my money? Rocks and Fabo. All right, go, go, go. <laughs> Here we go, like gangbusters. Everybody's getting cuffed. I didn't do anything, man, I swear. All right, good job, go ahead and cuff him. School me, pig! Punch me! She's screaming, calling us every name she can think of, including some I haven't heard in a long time. Conversation down at the station. I right, go ahead and transport him. You ignore that. We handcuff everybody. We seize the car. We seize her. We seize him. At police headquarters, China Doll's bad attitude shows no signs of improving. I got nothing to say to you. Look, we've already got you for distribution. You're all done here. I told you it wasn't drugs. It's baby powder I use on my little niece. Is that the best you can do? I said, China Dog, what's going to happen here is we're going to get tired of you. We're just going to flush you down a toilet and put you in prison. And your opportunity to help yourself, that window is starting to close. Now you want to crawl through it? Listen, I can't tell you nothing. That boy who shot that man, he'll cut me too if I snitch. I think you know that's not true. It's a misnomer to believe the snitches are murdered. They're not. I've had one get murdered in my entire career one besides if you think your life's in danger we're the only ones that can help you but you gotta come clean first nah i'm all right so he said we know you sold drugs to douglas warren we know that and if you want to take the fall for his murder it's okay with me. but let me tell you honey somebody's going to jail for this and it might as well be you and that's enough to push her over the edge it was the guy's own fault. He should never stole our dope. Well, that fits. She was there, and she knows. Why don't you tell us exactly what happened? I took one of my girls out to the Baja Lounge to sell, and I was watching from across the parking lot. China Doll is not a dumb individual. She doesn't want to be with her drugs. Should cops show up so she's more than happy to loan it out to her girlfriends to sell for her hey baby you need anything what you got the car window talking to my girl and they start fighting wait what is this you trying to rip me off china Just as Douglas Warren pulls his head out of the car and has a plastic baggie in his hand and starts running. I'm yelling and stuff, and then out of nowhere, bang. Guy comes out with a gun. Who's the guy? T-Bone. I don't know his real name. But he works for you. No. He's not one of mine. He just hangs around places like Baja Lounge. She emphasizes that he's not part of her crew. He's only 16. He hasn't been in the game that long. But what he is is violent, and he always has a gun. Well, if he wasn't with you, why would he shoot the guy stealing your drugs? I mean, why would he care? I don't know. Why don't you ask him? You know how we can get in touch with him? <laughs> really? You don't know? You cops are fools. Trying to know calling us fools doesn't bother me already called us a lot worse. What bothers me is she apparently knows something I don't. Little did I know it would be something that would change the entire case. In the murder of Douglas Warren, the drug dealer China Doll has revealed that there should someone named T-Bone. 
We're asking her where to find him when she drops a major piece of information on us. Well, if you know where this T-bone is, uh, we'd love to be in on the secret. Oh, it's no secret, all right. Man, you guys are so stupid. He's locked up right now. She said he got arrested for another shooting he did, and I've heard the cops took the gun away from him, and he's in jail. Juvie. So we were a little floored by that. I don't blame her for looking at us like we were stupid. Apparently we are. Come on, let's go. So we have our guy somewhere in the system. So it won't be difficult to run down who T-Bone is and where he is. And more importantly, where is the gun they took from him? What about me? I'll just sit tight. We'll make sure narcotics takes good care of you. We'll leave China Doll in the hands of the Metro Vice Narcotics people because now she becomes their problem on the drug charge. We move off to find T-Bone in the juvenile detention facility. Hey, we're looking for a kid who probably came in here about two days ago. Goes by the name of T-Bone. Oh yeah, T-Bone. That's uh, Timothy Mayon. Can you take us to him? Yeah, I wish I could. He bonded out yesterday. Right, thanks a lot. Thank you. So T-Bone is back in the wind, but at least we know who T-Bone is. He is Timothy Mayon. We need to determine the details of his arrest, and I want to talk to the arresting officer and find out what the circumstances were of that case. Officers received a disturbance call. Shots fired on East Fountain Street. Police find Timothy Mayon sitting in a parked car in proximity to the party. He's pointed out to them as the guy shooting a gun, and they search the car, and they recover a pistol from the car. Took him into custody, 16 years old. Timothy Mayon looks like a little kid. He doesn't look like he's even 16. But he put a gun in his hand and he's Godzilla. You mentioned they recovered a weapon. Yeah, they're holding it in evidence. What's the caliber? It's 25 caliber. I want you to get to the lab. I'll see if we get a match. Yes, sir. Thanks. So now it's a simple matter of asking ballistics people to examine this weapon with the expended casing recovered at the scene of the Baja Lounge and the slug removed from Douglas Warren's body. Later that day, Kenda gets his answer. Hey, Lieutenant. Slug from Douglas Warren. It matches that gun you had sent over. You sure? They're positive. Right, thank you. So, we now have the one piece of evidence that ties this guy directly to our investigation. Our next job is to get him. We have an address on Bayon from his prior arrests. going over there alone. We already know he's trigger happy, so we bring back up just in case this gets ugly. Um, can I help you? We're with the Colorado Springs Police Department. Yeah, we have an arrest warrant for a Timothy man. Uh, we tend to search his premises. Please, please step aside. Well, I'm his mother. He ain't here. Her attitude is less than cooperative. She says, well, he's staying with a friend in Denver, but I don't know the friend's name. Listen, honey, I'm in a Arkansas. So I'm really going to have time for this nonsense. Man, we are going to search these premises. And we said, wait a minute. If I determine you're harboring a fugitive by whatever means, by lying to us, by saying he's somewhere he isn't, I'm going to place you under arrest and you're not moving anywhere, except for the county jail. So I'm going to ask you one more time. Please step aside. Suit yourself. evidence tying him to the murder. Quit touching all my stuff. She says she's moving this family to Arkansas, but there doesn't seem to be one thing in a box anywhere in this house. So if they're moving, they're apparently moving with what's on their backs. Oh, man, the house is clear. Your son's not here. Yeah, I told you that. But if he does show up here, I strongly encourage you to call the police. Yeah, whatever. We tell mom we'll be back. And it may be likely you wind up in jail as a result. You have a nice afternoon. You know, she was just delightful. <laughs> Is everything okay? I will attend a candle with the police. Uh, you live here? Yeah, but not for long. Oh, yeah? Where are you going? 
to Arkansas. My grandma lives there. The kids are pretty friendly, and they find out that this is the suspect's brother. Is the whole family moving there? Uh, even your brother, Tim? Yeah, Tim is actually on his way down there. And you kind of feel bad for the little brother in a way. He doesn't know what's going on with his family or that his brother's probably involved in a murder. Do you know what kind of car Tim drove out there? He didn't drive. He took the bus. So now we know where T-Bone is. Thank you. Have a good trip. Let's go. A killer on the run is never a good thing. And it has the potential to get a hell of a lot worse. who shot Douglas Warren may be on a bus headed out of state. So we're headed to the bus station to try to find him. Thank you. You're welcome. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good. We're looking for a teen by the name of Timothy Mann. Uh, we believe he may be on a bus on his way to Arkansas. Um, let me check. Yes, uh, Timothy Mayon. Looks like he had a prepaid ticket, but he never picked it up. All right, so at least we know he hasn't left yet, right? Well, well no, not necessarily. He could have walked up and purchased another ticket, and we don't require a name for that. Back then, if you just walked up to the gate and bought the ticket, it was like going into a movie theater, basically. You had a ticket, you got on the bus. They didn't know what your name was or who you were. So there's no way for us to know whether or not he's on that Arkansas bus? I'm sorry. I'm afraid not. All right, let's get Mayon's photo distributed. Let's place a couple of our guys here in case we get lucky and he shows up. All right. All right, thank you. You're welcome. It's really kind of hit or miss when we're... Investigators staking out the bus depot. Kenda and Ritz return to Timothy Mayon's home to see if his mother has had a change of heart. We go back to this house a couple of hours later. We're going to knock on the door. And the door opens from the knock. It's not even closed. Hello? Well, that was quick. All the property inside is gone. So Mrs. Mayon has decided to flee the jurisdiction rather than be confronted a second time or maybe even arrested. Looks like they didn't take everything. We find several live 25 caliber shells. How interesting. Timothy left a calling card. Kind of weird they weren't there beforehand or at least we didn't see them originally we don't know if somebody's taunting us or playing games there they are 25s sure all right let's go kenda is now convinced his prime suspect has fled the state it's a thousand miles from Colorado Springs to Little Rock, Arkansas. He thinks that's far enough. He's never heard the expression of the long arm of the law, apparently. Okay, so we've got some addresses on the Mayon kit, um, but the most likely one looks like it's going to be this one in Pulaski County. We determined that the family in question lives in the jurisdiction of the Pulaski County Sheriff's Department in Arkansas. So we call her Fugitive Division. Hi, this is Lieutenant Kenneth from the Colorado Springs Police Department. Here, yeah, we're working a homicide, and we think our suspect might be out your way. His name's uh, Timothy Mayon, and uh, we believe he's staying with relatives very close to you. We provide them with the information we have on the grandmother, the aunt, the addresses we've determined, and a photograph of Timothy Mayon. All right, I appreciate the help. Thanks. Bye. So the hunt is on in Arkansas by the locals for Timothy Mayon. Authorities in Arkansas actually set up a surveillance on the house that we thought uh, Tim might be staying at. Hey, do you got anything? Nobody in or out for the last hour. Okay, I think this is him. I think this is our guy. I'll follow your lead. Sure enough, they see a person matching the description of Tim walking down the street listening to a walkman. Yep, that's him. Let's get him. Roger. He's not anticipating that police are going to be watching for him, he thinks, or anything.
he makes a turn toward that house, that's enough. That's going to be him. Tim Mayan. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Pete never even saw him coming. He was paying attention to the music and his walkman, and they were able to come up right behind him. Turn around, face me. Put your hands up. You're under arrest for the murder of Douglas Warren. They said nothing to them. Didn't even acknowledge the fact that he was Timothy Mayon. They put him in a police car and took him back to the sheriff's department to hold him in custody for extradition. Back to the state of Colorado to face charges. When he's returned from Arkansas to Colorado Springs, he invokes his right to remain silent, and we inform him that's fine, that is his right. We don't need a statement from him. We have enough information to piece together what happened. Warren is a victim of his addiction to crack cocaine and knew he could get drugs in the parking lot of the Baja Lounge. So when his cousin Tony leaves to go see his girlfriend, Douglas Warren leaves the club in the hopes of making a score. I'll give you two rocks for 20 bucks. Even though it was payday, he's in the Baja Lounge with limited resources. He says he has two 20s, but what he has is two $1 bills. Wait, what is this? You trying to rip me off, Douglas grabs the bag. Hey, what the f are you doing? And at the same time, China Doll is in this parking lot, and when he turns to run and she sees that bag in his hand, she yells, Someone stop him! Timothy Mayon is a 16-year-old kid new to the scene. Leon sees an opportunity to enhance his reputation by taking a shot at this perpetrator who he doesn't even know. When Mayon shoots this victim, he could have fired 200 bullets at him in the dark and never touched him. It's very unusual. He could not have repeated that if he was Annie Oakley. I often think about him. He wanted to work. He wanted to have a family. You know, we're supposed to be having the time of our lives, and it just didn't happen. At the end of this case, Tim ended up pleading guilty to second-degree murder as a juvenile, 16 years old. And was sentenced to five years, the maximum amount of time he could have gotten. No one could have predicted this would happen. But you could easily predict that Douglas Warren's interest in narcotics would end badly. And this one ended as badly as you could make it happen. A young mother found dead in a cemetery. She'd been stabbed 25 times. The killer saw Cynthia McLuhan as this object to play with by posing her. It sounds profoundly sick because it is. For three years, police are baffled. The investigation continues until we find out who's responsible. It was a total mystery. Until Sergeant Joe Kendra realizes this case goes much deeper than he ever imagined. And all the experience of all the people in his room have never seen this before. <laughs> Could this be the rarest of criminals? A savagely evil serial killer. When a case becomes cold, it's the ultimate frustration. You are searching for a shadow, a ghost. But do we surrender? Absolutely not. There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories.
I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. It's getting late, and the Uinta Gardens shopping center is looking like a ghost town. The pharmacy is the last store to lock up. The store was being closed at 9.45 by the manager, Joe, and her Linda, who was one of the cashiers. There was snow outside, and it was cold. Is that Cynthia's car? Looks like it. Cynthia worked the cosmetic counter. What's she still doing here? Immediately... This is bad because she checked out 45 minutes before. The lights were on and the car was running. Cynthia? And the windshield had some ice scraped off. Where is she? We just thought that was kind of strange. Why would she leave her car just sitting there running? Cynthia! Cynthia? None of it made any sense at all. The worst thing you could possibly think comes to your mind. Cynthia! 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 Three years later, after a long stint in patrol, Sergeant Joe Kenda has recently returned to homicide. But this time... As the boss, you always have feelings about what you'd like to do to improve things, to change things. So I began reviewing unsolved missing persons cases and unsolved homicide cases to determine if there was any possibility they could now be resolved. Hey Beverly, I need to schedule a meeting. Uh, can you contact everyone in the field and have them here by 12 o'clock sharp? Thanks. Bye. All right, gentlemen, listen up. Now, you guys have done one hell of a job last year closing cases. Uh, but this year, I think we can do a little bit better. When Kinda took over as a sergeant in the detective bureau, we welcomed his involvement. He was smart, well-educated, very charismatic. I want to revisit some of the cold cases that we let slip through. The question is, which ones do we look at? Now, I've got a few thoughts, but I want to hear your ideas. With my team of homicide detectives, I wanted some unit cohesion, and I was interested in what they thought about everything. Many heads are better than one. How about you, Lou? Any ideas? Detective Lou Smith had an instinct for it, unlike any other. Well, I didn't work it, but uh, how about uh, Cynthia McLuhan? She went missing in... 82. Mm. The Cynthia McLuhan case was one we all really wanted to solve. All right, let's look at the case file. Though none of Kenda's detectives personally worked the case, they knew enough to bring him up to speed. Cynthia McLuhan. She was 22 years old when she went missing. Co-workers found her abandoned vehicle in the parking lot where she worked. No evidence in the car and no witnesses. Okay, then. Who did they talk to first? The family. Detectives went to the home of Cynthia's mom. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Which is where Cynthia's living with her daughter, Stacy. And Cynthia's friend, Mary, is there also. Look, I know this is all very, very shocking, but we need to know more about your daughter if we're going to find her. Well... Cynthia and Stacy moved in with me recently because money's been a little tight. Cynthia works two jobs and I help out and watch Stacy. Is she aware of what's going on? No, not really. She keeps asking for her mama, but I don't know what to say. I keep telling her she'll be home soon. Cynthia did everything she did for her girl, for her daughter. Her relationship with her daughter was what we need to find out is if there was anyone in Cynthia's life who would want to harm her. The next step would be to determine who does Cynthia associate with. People don't get abducted, generally, by a stranger. 
I don't know. It was a total mystery. I mean, no idea what had happened. Cynthia really did not have enemies. Can't say that there was really anybody that disliked her. What about Stacy's father? Where is he? He and Cynthia were married for a short time, but things didn't work out. They're curious about someone that had a motive to do her harm. And the first and obvious choice is the ex-husband. But he lives in Arizona. Even at the first moment of disappearance, there was never a thought of him doing anything like that. They talked to him on the phone. He is in Arizona. And he provides an alibi the day she goes missing. He's not part of this. How about a boyfriend? Was uh, Cynthia seeing anyone that you know of? Well, recently she's been seeing a guy named Dave. Um, Dave. Winfield. Dave Winfield. And, of course, the detectives are immediately interested in David Winfield. Who is he? Did they end their relationship badly? What do you know about Dave? Is there any, any issues with him? I don't know of any issues during the relationship, but I know that Dave was pretty heartbroken when she ended things. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Good job. What letter is this? No, you don't know? Yeah, sure you do. That's a J. I'll get it. Hello? Hi, it's me. Listen, can we just talk? I love you. If we could just give it another try. Dave, we've talked about this, okay? Cynthia. No, You don't Dave. understand. I'm sorry, I gotta go. Wait. do anything to get her back. There was concern on the mother's part that the ex-boyfriend might have tried to abduct her to try to force her into accepting their relationship and going back the way it was. At that point, detectives focused their attention on 34-year-old Dave Winfield as Cynthia's possible abductor. Detectives did some digging. They found out that Dave secretly spent some time at the hide-and-seek. At the time, the Hide and Seek Lounge was the largest homosexual bar between the Mississippi River and the West Coast. That information certainly put a different perspective on the case. So apparently, like in the modern day, homosexuality is universally accepted for the most part. In the 1980s, it was a secret world. In Colorado Springs, having a gay affair was particularly scandalous. It could hurt you at your job. If you were in the military, it could get you discharged. I mean, the ramifications were huge. The speculation might have been that Cynthia somehow discovered this, and Dave Winfield was now trying to suppress that information from coming out. Once Dave found out that we were asking around town about him, he decided to show up at the station. No kidding. Did you have anything to do with the disappearance of Cynthia? I care a lot for Cynthia. I'd never do anything to hurt her. Did she have any issues with your little trips down to the hide-and-seek lounge? What? How do you know about that? Look, Mr. Winfield, we're not interested in your private life. We're just trying to figure out, perhaps, would that be a problem for Cynthia if she was aware of that? No. No, okay? Cynthia never knew about that. Even if she did, she wouldn't tell anyone. So, it gives you an insight on Cynthia. She just seemed to be a nice, trustworthy woman. Did you have an alibi? Yeah. It checked out. So, when is out no opportunity okay so what's next it turns out that more evidence surfaced the night that uh, Cynthia disappeared just two hours after Cynthia McLuhan vanished from work a sinister clue was discovered at a nearby motel in doing his nightly rounds a security guard for one of the motels what the hell came across some clothing outside 
the clothing is just dropped, dumped in a pile. And under the clothing is a purse. There are credit cards, there's some money. And it also contains Cynthia McLuhan's Colorado driver's license. The motel had no record of Cynthia checking in. And when the items were turned in to police, they quickly caught the attention of detectives. Was the clothing hers? They matched the description that she was last seen wearing when she left for. What do you mean? Her bra and panties were missing. The clothing that's missing are intimate apparel, so it suggests there may have been some sexual involvement. When there's evidence of abduction and sexual assault, the end result is never good. The room where the clothes were found outside of, were you looking at who checked into it? We did. It turns out that the apartment wasn't rented for one week. And nothing materialized from there. Detectives have been all over the area for weeks. They didn't turn up any new leads. When someone goes missing, the more time that passes by, the more difficult things become. You have no place to go and nowhere to find your victim until they are found by someone. It was a bone-chilling afternoon, 42 days after Cynthia McLuhan disappeared from her workplace. A 17-year-old named Robert Stogner was jogging through a cemetery in the west side of Colorado Springs. As Robert went through Fairview Cemetery, he noticed something looked odd. And in fact, as he got closer, this is no longer a missing person's case. Somebody took her and killed her. disappearance of 22-year-old Cynthia McLuhan. She has been missing for 42 days when her body has been discovered in Fairview Cemetery. Because it was so cold outside, her body was well preserved. In cold temperatures, aside from the whiteness of the skin, they look the same as they did when they were alive. It's a brutal scene. responded to the cemetery. Cynthia's body was covered with blood. She'd been stabbed numerous times. She was completely naked except for her shoes and her socks. There are definite signs of sexual assault. Yeah, no doubt. There is rape. There is murder. Her bra and panties are missing from the pile of clothes at the motel. Killer probably kept them for himself. Missions of the victim that it's a trophy. It can be a source of pride when they remember that they were able to subdue another human being. Could have our bodies just positioned up like that. Yeah, that's strange. She's kind of sitting down but bent forward. A very unnatural position. It's not one that would look comfortable. Out of all the homicides I've worked, I don't remember ever coming across a body position just this way. Some sexual criminals will pose the remains and stand back and admire them for a period of time. It sounds profoundly sick because it is. This guy didn't hold anything back, did he? She had been stabbed 25 times. Get some photos. So we know if the sexual assault happened in the cemetery or is it just a nothing ground? Well, it's possible. We didn't see any drag marks or any kind of blood trails. This is a remote cemetery with very little foot traffic, which is precisely why Cynthia's killer brought her there. The ghost, the shadow, shows up in that parking lot. Let go! Come on! Forcibly puts her in his car, drives to the cemetery, raped her, and immediately killed her in the same spot. 
with her clothing and dumped it in this motel in the central downtown. Canvas of the area turn up anything? Sort of. We came across a guy who said he saw a dark-colored pickup truck leave the cemetery a few weeks before. So we looked throughout the neighborhood to see if we could find a similar pickup truck. One of the people that we find who would own that pickup truck is a Richie Hyden. He lived two and a half blocks from the Fairview Cemetery. This guy said he was at the cemetery, but he was there because of the great view at Pikes Peak. Sounds a little suspicious, but we couldn't find anything that ties him to Cynthia. There's nothing about him that alarms them. He has an explanation for his behavior. Okay, then what? Nothing. Case went cold. They believed it was someone connected to her that hated her for whatever reason. But they could never determine that anybody she'd ever known hated her for any reason at all. So the case sort of dies. After the notification of finding Cynthia and still no leads, it just went on for a long time, several years of no information or nothing being said about it. Very, very difficult. Okay, then. It's time to heat this thing back up. We, that inspires us. John, Lou, I want you to take the lead on this one, but we're all going to be working it with you. This case had a lot of emotional appeal. Personally, this was one I really wanted to take on. So the working theory of the case still remains that it's someone she knew. The reason that's true is stranger crimes are rare. They represent less than 5% of all murders. The first thing we need to do is read and review the original witnesses and revisit the old leads. Start with the guy with the dark truck. Uh, what's his name? Richie Hyden. Time has a way of loosening tongues. And everybody, every experienced policeman knows it. All right, let's go. I'm thinking we should start with this guy first because he's got a record a mile long and we're looking for... Hey. So Anderson is assigned a lead about Richie Hyden. Man, Richie Hyden has a sexual assault conviction. It's not all. Look at his employment history. Take a guess at where he worked as a dishwasher in 1982. I'll be damned. Lo and behold, what does he find? During the time of the crime, he worked at the motel where the clothing was discovered. You don't have to be a mathematician to know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So, Mr. Hyden, we need to have an up close and personal with you again. We have reopened the Cynthia McLuhan homicide as a cold case. During the course of that work, we have determined an individual some very interesting parts to his life that makes him emerge as a suspect. Kent and his team would like to speak with 30-year-old Richie Hyden, but he no longer lives by Fairview Cemetery. In fact, he's now on parole in Wyoming. So you're saying we're going to have to send you to Wyoming? Maybe before we do that, we see if he's worth our time. We knew from Cynthia's autopsy that when Cynthia was uh, sexually assaulted, her killer left behind evidence of his own blood type. So we can compare that with the blood type of a potential suspect and eliminate certain people. The next step in terms of this individual, Mr. Hyden, is to determine what is his blood type. Why don't you check with the lab and let me know what you find out. Sir? So Detective Anderson makes a call to the lab that evidence has already been obtained because of the count of sexual assault. Stick out your arm, make a fist. And as it turns out, his blood type is different than that of the perpetrator of this crime. So despite his truck, despite his criminal record, despite his employment at the hotel, it's not him. Without a suspect, Kanda and his team begin retracing old steps in hopes of sprouting a new lead. 
one thing we wanted to do was to go back and talk to Cynthia's close friends at the time. One of those was Mary Donito. She had been at Nancy's house, the mother's house. Her and Cynthia were best, best friends. I, I assumed that the investigation was over. No, ma'am. The investigation continues until we find out who's responsible. Mary, we're wondering if uh, you might remember anything that you might have forgot to mention when Cynthia first went missing. Mm, well, there, there is something I probably should have said a long time ago. Well, if it's something that might help us find Cynthia's killer, I'm sure she would want us to know. There was a guy that Cynthia was dating that um, nobody knew about. Why was it a secret? Um, he was married. He's married? Really? Now that's interesting. I, I should have said something sooner. Um, I just, I didn't want to say anything in front of Cynthia's mom, and at that point we were hoping she was still alive. Mary, it's okay. You got to keep in mind, this was her good, good friend, and so I understand why she didn't do it at that point. So who is this guy? His name's Steve Carlton. Um, she had a second job, and he worked with her there. You finding everything okay? I am, but do you have any socks? Cynthia? And Steve Carlton met because he was working as a security guard. According to Mary, he had told Cynthia that he was getting a divorce. Turned out that wasn't the case. Cynthia, I'm sorry. All right, I should have told you sooner. Yeah, you should have, you lying piece of <laughs> Now I'm the one who looks like the bad guy. Maybe I should just call your wife and see how she feels about all of this. Sometimes, married men want to protect their wife from ever finding out. Murder is one way to do it. Do you know if Steve still works at the same place? Not that I... We've been very helpful. Thank you for being honest with us. We'll let ourselves out. After learning of Steve Carlton, investigators reach out to Fort Carson to see if he has shown up on their radar. Active military have their own police called the CID, which stands for Criminal Investigation Division. They investigate criminal matters involving active duty military. Sergeant Steve Carlton. Who does I remember that name from? Says in 82, he put in a transfer for South Korea. Really? And what month was that? Be December. That was shortly after Cynthia's murder. So our question was, was he trying to distance himself from this murder? Was his request granted? No, it was denied due to poor performance on his part. He's been under investigation multiple times. And what do you do? Sexual misconduct. Turns out this guy is accused of making obscene phone calls to various women on the base. Further, there's been someone going into the ladies' locker rooms on the post and stealing their underwear. And the military police believe it's this guy. That's bizarre. Yeah, you could say that. All right, we're going to need to speak with Mr. Carlton uh, as soon as possible. Think I'll make that happen? Mr. Carlton now emerges. Not only does he have a relationship with our victim, now we have knowledge that he's potentially involved in sex crimes in the military. That adds up to suspect. So here we have a married man who is dating Cynthia McLuhan. He's currently under investigation for two minor sexual offenses. So let's go find Mr. Carlton and see what he has to say. Sergeant Carlton, uh, thanks for coming to talk to us. What's this about? Cynthia McLuhan. Cynthia. Did you guys find the guy that killed her? We were, we were having a relationship.
relationship with her. Is that true? Um, yeah, we did. Mr. Carlton says they became friends, they began to socialize after work on a few occasions, and then they engaged in an extramarital affair. What exact date was that? Mine. Was Cynthia upset about that? No. I mean, we both knew what we were doing was wrong. He says he finally decided to break it off because he was afraid his wife would find out. You think I killed Cynthia? We didn't say that. But you were having a secret relationship with her. And we were also made aware of some of the questionable things you did in the past. Like what? Some inappropriate acts over at Fort Carson. Oh, that's garbage. I didn't do any of that stuff. He vehemently denies both of these crimes. I didn't do it. I never called anybody. I've been in that locker room. Look, I didn't kill Cynthia. I didn't have any reason to want to harm her. Once when I found out that she was murdered, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know. She was a good person. I swear on my life, I didn't kill Cynthia. Steve Carlton claimed he really cared for her, that he wouldn't have killed her. You seem very believable. All right, you're free to go. For now. He is just somebody that we thought was interesting, and we've just lost interest in him. With yet another suspect out of the running, the investigation begins to lose steam. Where are we now in this case? Why can't we find a legitimate suspect who has a relationship with our victim? Same dead end we hit three years ago. Kenda wonders. Perhaps he's been going about this the wrong way. Instead of focusing on the victim, what about the crime itself? In this case, think about it. Abduction from a parking lot, rape, extreme knife violence, the way you position the body. I mean, this all seems pretty peculiar. Sexual criminals commit a crime in precisely the same way on every occasion. These are not isolated incidents. These people tend to commit and reoffend all the time. It's what they do. Their appetite increases for the behavior. Okay, are you saying you think this is a serial kill? Well, it's certainly a possibility. But that would mean he's done this before, or at least in the three years since. Let me ask you this. Have either of you been involved in a murder like this before? Because I sure have. Me. Hey. No. What if our guy doesn't have a relationship with our victim? What if our man is a transient? He is a tourist. He's here for a time and then he's gone again. And he is elsewhere doing the same thing. We've never considered it. Which means we're gonna... All right, listen up. Kenda and his team expand their search to a national scale. So we put together a broadcast to all law enforcement agencies in the U.S. Describing our crime and asking for similar offenses or similar MOs by perpetrators in their jurisdiction. From huge departments to tiny ones. The national broadcast is out for a while, and we're not getting much results. Hey, Kenda, I think I've got something here. But all of a sudden, we do. It's from Florida. Lou Smith found a correspondence from a homicide detective in St. Petersburg, Florida, mentioning a James Lamar Rhodes. The guy's 26 years old. It says here he's raped and attempted murder of four different girls with a knife. He's also suspected of two full-blown murders. Sound familiar? Rhodes had abducted four young girls in 45 days. One of them sounded remarkably similar to Cynthia's. In June of 1984, a 17-year-old girl who worked at an ice cream shop went outside into her shift. Hey, you want to go for a jog? And a man approached her. Come on. What are you doing? Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. I wouldn't say a word if I were you. The man then took her to a secluded place by some railroad tracks and proceeded. 
admitted to rape her and stab her repeatedly. James Rhodes left her for dead. But she did not die. Somehow she survived and was able to identify Rose as a suspect, and the physical evidence confirmed it. Guess where the bastard was December 82? Colorado Springs. He was living in Colorado Springs for approximately 60 days during the time frame that the Cynthia McLuhan case occurred. So how do we find this guy? Well, he's currently in Florida prison. He's serving six consecutive life sentences for attempted murder. Looks like we need to go to Florida. When somebody gives you a series of facts that are so good that fit perfectly with what you're doing, you can feel it. James Lamar Rose is our target. We need to go to Florida and have him tell us that. Well, the only way to get this sicko is to get a confession from him. You know, game. I selected Detective Smith because Smith had a gift. He was the most remarkable interrogator I have ever seen. It was almost as if Lou Smith could walk into a field full of cows and in 15 minutes they'd be offering him free milk. All right, we need to learn as much as we can about him. Anderson, I want you to lead the research on this guy. You got it. Let's do this. It's important when a detective sits down with a suspect that you're armed with as much information as you can. While Smith is en route to Florida, Kenda's team is preparing background info to pass on to him. Can you hang on a second? So what do you got from Anderson? This guy definitely had his issues. We pulled his psychological profile from the state of Florida. It seems he grew up in a dysfunctional family. I gotta call you back. Thanks. Bye. James Earl suffered a great deal of trauma in his growing up. Watching his father beat his mother. He getting beaten up by his mother. It was a family full of turmoil, full of violence. So apparently he had a pretty tumultuous relationship with his mother. Where the hell are you, James? As James Rhodes reports, his mother is a brutal woman. I'm warning you, get your ass over here. She would hit him mercilessly and in fact encouraged him in many ways to embrace violence. He seemed he could have harbored hate for women that may have come from his mother. He was so filled with hate for his mother. He left home when he was 14, and he literally became a drifter. Looks like Schmidt's gonna have his hands full with this guy. I'd say. The following day. Smith arrives at Florida's Cross City Correctional Center to speak with their number one suspect. This is Smith's opportunity to work his magic, and he is magical. Mr. Rhodes, I'd like to thank you for having this meeting with me. I'm Detective Smith. I understand you want to talk about you. You see, James, I'm curious as to how you ended up in Colorado a few years back. Uh, no particular reason. Struggled to find work in Texas, so I always loved the mountains. I headed over to Colorado Springs and found a job as a roofer. I did a little carpentry myself. Yeah? Yeah, I was not an expert, but you know, I did some stuff around the house. Made me feel like a man. Like I was really in control. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Smith knew how to establish rapport with Rhodes. In a very short period of time, they were chatting as if they were lifelong friends. James, you probably saw a lot of different places when you were, when you were a kid, right? Well, I bet that was hard, having to always be responsible for yourself. It was no 
South Africa. What do you mean? You wouldn't believe some of the things I've done in the places I've been. Hell, I'd, I'd write a book about it if they wouldn't throw me in the electric chair. All serial killers are narcissists. They like attention. And I think if it were possible, every psychopathic killer would probably write a book. Because they would then have a chance to brag about what they did. And what would you write about with, during your stay up there in Colorado? Look, I tell you, but I don't want them to fry me. What if I told you that they won't? The DA says he'll take the death penalty off the table. says we're going to transport you back to Colorado and I want you to walk me through this. I want you to show me what you did. All right. What the hell? Not 24 hours later, Kenda picks up Smith and Rhodes at the airport and they set out on their guided tour of murder. When James Rhodes came back to Colorado, he wanted to show off. He was going to get one more thrill out of it and show how well he did what he did. It was right here. I saw her leaving work. Something just came over me. You didn't know her? I'd never seen her before. She was scraping her windows on her car. Hey. And he walked up behind her. Can I help you? Oh, no, I got it. Thanks. <laughs> Come on, well, let me help you. No, it's fine. Get Get it. Oh, shut up. Ah. Ah. He said he threw her in his car. Get in the car. Ah. Shut up. Ah. Now, Cynthia McClellan weighed 107 pounds. He could easily take physical control of her. Let's go. He said he wound up in a cemetery, a secluded area. Right over here. This is where it was. I took out the knife and I told her to get on the ground. Please don't kill me. Get on the ground. I will do anything. Get off. Get off. He just roped her. said she tried to grab the knife and it infuriated him he said my arm was just flying with that knife he said i normally don't stab people more than a few times i don't know why i stabbed her so many 25 times you say god that's really nuts isn't it yes james it really is nuts. Just like you. Frankly, I think he was enjoying himself so much he couldn't stop. He saw Cynthia McLuhan as this object to play with. And it seems quite possible he continued his play with her by imposing her. He left her. He had her clothing in the car and he thought he had to get rid of that. So he drove by this motel and dumps the clothing in the purse. What'd you do with her bronchitis? I don't remember. I find that hard to believe. He has a good memory, and yet he says he doesn't remember certain things, and that's nonsense. He does remember. All right, let's go. But for whatever reason, he doesn't want to say it. The state of Colorado convicts James Rhodes of first-degree murder and sentences him to life in prison. But he won't be serving that time just yet. Florida has first dibs on this guy. So he goes back to Florida to serve six consecutive life terms. And if he survives that, he comes to Colorado to serve yet another one. Although he's only been convicted of attempted murder in Florida, James Rose cases have been proven. One of the major misconceptions about serial killers is that they are crazy. They are not crazy. They are very disturbed. They're him. 
also seem to reign freely in a way that's more consistent with a wild animal than a human being. He was just a monster. How can somebody do the awful things that he did and leave a little girl without her mother? Cynthia's little girl is now grown. She's had two daughters. And if my sister Cynthia was still here, she would be ecstatic being able to see her two grandchildren. Still heartbroken because she's not here. Initially, everyone believed it was someone that Cynthia knew because that's usually the case. But the reality was that she, unfortunately, breathed the same air as a very rare snake, a serial killer. A husband and father tragically takes his own life. The victim still had a 22 caliber revolver in his hands. Maybe he just had enough of the paint. You know? But an unexpected confession reveals there's much more to the story. No, this is not what I saw. And it's up to Kenda and his team to uncover a cache of secrets and lies. I knew that Charlie was having an affair. She burns through that $10,000 just in a few months. Is this something that could push somebody over their edge to commit murder? You bet it is. <laughs> appear a certain way to casual acquaintances. They were the nicest people. They were quiet. But you never, ever know what goes on in a private home when the doors are closed and the lights are up. There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. It's a busy summer night for Colorado Springs. EMTs Mark McDonald and Mark Bruning are responding to a call at a residence near Palmer Park on the city's east side. Once we got there at the PD, we're already on scene, and so our part of our job was to go in and actually assess the patient. He's in the master bedroom. All right. It's kind of surreal, to tell you the truth, because you're thrown immediately into this chaotic scene. into the room there was a gentleman with a at that time that this gentleman was deceased <laughs> several miles away sergeant joe kenda is already waist deep in an unrelated investigation did the suspect make a statement no not yet he had a bloody knife on him. I think it's a murder weapon. It's after 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm at the scene of a homicide. Crime never sleeps. Crime never takes a day off. And everybody seems to like the cover of darkness. The corner's on his way. Great. Dispatch to 4 Paul 1. Go for 4 Paul 1. 
We have a report of a shooting near Palmer Park. First responders are saying they believe it's self-inflicted. The initial report was this is probably a suicide, and I decided to remain at my current crime scene and send one of my detectives and report back to me. Within the hour, Kenda has dispatched one of his detectives to the residence near Palmer Park. Good evening, detective. Hey, what do we got here? 39-year-old male, single gunshot went to the head. Appears to be self-inflicted. They had identified him as an individual named Charlie Tuttle, who actually worked for the city of Colorado Springs in the electric division. Before I met Charlie, he was a staff sergeant in the Air Force, and he worked in electronics preparing and calibrating flight simulators. He was always perceived as uh, a very honest and trustworthy person. It's like a wife, a stepdaughter, and a neighbor discovered him in the bedroom. We cut the neighbors loose. He uh, didn't know anything. Okay. And where's the body? Upstairs in the bedroom. Either way. In the master bedroom, Mr. Tuttle is laying face down on the bed. The family found him like this? Yes, sir. On initial examination of the scene, detectives noted that, in fact, the victim still had a 22 caliber in his hands. And there was a single entry gunshot wound to the back of the head, and there is no exit. What an odd way to shoot yourself. Most gun suicides, the person sees someone lying their stomachs and shoots themselves in the back of the head. Anyone touch that shot? No, it was positioned there we arrived. And this particular shotgun had string wrapped around the trigger. Now that is indicative of someone trying to rig a weapon so they can cause it to discharge by aiming at themselves. But he rigs this gun and then apparently changes his mind. <laughs> and he decides to use a handgun instead. As investigators examine the rest of the continues to line up with that theory. It looks like somebody kicked the door in. This is the only entry into the room. There's a shoe print on the door next to the door handle assembly. Witnesses claim that they broke the door in after they heard the gunshot. We have an individual who was depressed and actually locked himself in the bedroom, climbed into bed and shot himself. That's a pretty good possibility at this point. To confirm that possibility, Investigators need to see if witnesses' stories lead to the same conclusion. Well, let's go talk to the family. If he killed himself, maybe they can tell us why. They then speak to the wife of the victim, whose name is Jackie Tuttle. She's 42 years of age. Mrs. Tuttle, I'm so sorry for your loss. Do you mind answering a few questions? Jackie is kind of quiet, soft-spoken. She worked for a real estate company, and she had been married to Charles for about 14 years. He was actually her second husband. Do you and Charlie have any kids together? No. I have two grown children from my first marriage. My older daughter, Jennifer, she lives back in Texas with her father. And Sarah, she lives here with us, and she was here tonight. She's the evening progressed in a normal manner, except for the fact that Charlie was drinking heavily during dinner. Now, how much alcohol did Charlie consume? I don't know, like 10 beers. 
and some whiskey. After dinner, and uh, continued to drink, and said he was going to bed. So around midnight, Sarah and I went down and put a movie in downstairs. <laughs> it was when we heard the gunshot. so distressed and she could not continue conversing with the officers because of her emotional state. Hoping to learn why Charlie was distressed, investigators turned to Jackie's daughter, 19-year-old Sarah Reynolds. Excuse me, Sarah, do you have a moment to answer a few questions? They ask her to describe the events of the evening, separate from her mother, and she tells precisely the same story. So after dinner, Charlie went to bed, and Mom and I watched a movie in the living room. And it was about 1.30 when she heard a loud bang. What was that? upstairs but his door was locked we tried to force the door to open but it wouldn't budge and her mother said go get the neighbor he can help us and she did that the neighbor came over and kicked the door in and that's when we found him on the bed now i know this is difficult sarah but can you think of any reason that charlie may have wanted to end his life yeah. He was just so different since the accident. About a year earlier, he'd been in a very serious car accident. Come here, honey. Come here, let me help you. Please, just get that away. He was struck from behind by another car. It injured Charlie's neck and caused him pain in his neck and upper back. His personality changed after that. He was so down about everything constantly called out of work he became more depressed he drank more now all of that put together certainly sounds like someone who may be willing to end their days after dinner he was complaining that his neck hurt maybe he just had enough of the pain you know yeah once again i am uh... hours later sergeant kenda requests a status report on charlie tuttle's case we found it odd that he shot himself in the back of the head, but all of the evidence that we found at the scene is consistent with suicide. Yeah, so what's the coroner think? Oh, here's the report. By law, the coroner determines the method of death and the manner. Okay, thank you. The coroner's office is fully informed of the details about Charlie's recent history and his motor vehicle accident and his depression, and the coroner rules it as a suicide, and the matter is closed, or so everyone thought. Six months later, an unexpected visitor shows up at CSPD. Sarah Reynolds? All right, have a seat. Someone will be in just a moment. Thank you. When someone comes into police headquarters and asks to speak to someone in homicide, they are directed to a supervisor, which in that case was me. Hi, I'm Sergeant Kendi. I just thought I'd help you with. She had a pretty forlorn look on her face and was somewhat quiet. The body language suggests that maybe she just wants to leave and is sorry she came in here. It's all right. If you need to tell us, it'll be okay. Well, my stepfather, Charlie Tuttle, he died six months ago in our house. Okay. And she looked at me and she said, well, I told a story to the policeman about how my stepdad killed himself. But I was lying. Oh, my. Well, this is getting it.
39-year-old man named Charlie Tuttle is believed to have shot himself in the privacy of his locked bedroom. Now it's six months later, and a young lady has come forward to say she lied. None of what she said to the police was true. Okay, why don't you just start from the beginning? So, the night he died, I helped my mom make dinner. What's all this? Something special for Charlie. Jackie had actually picked up a bottle of Brown Earl whiskey, some cigars, and a fishing magazine. Wow, Mom. Right? And Sarah thought that was kind of unusual because marriage was coming to an end. I thought it was her way of showing him she still loved him and wanted to make things work. And then when Charlie came home, he was in such a good mood. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's not my birthday. <laughs> no? Oh, are you making your famous meatballs? <laughs> she said he was quite surprised and happy to see them fixing a nice meal for dinner. And when we sat down to dinner, Mom and Charlie were reminiscing about old times. This looks great. Yeah. No, I think it's fine. I think the horseradish went bad. He didn't care for the shrimp cocktail, but he certainly ate everything else and drank his beer as he normally did. Could you pass me that garlic bread, please? We had a really nice evening. And then Mom wanted to watch a movie. But Charlie said he's going to bed to read his fishing mag. Do you remember what time that was? No, I just remember the movie started, and I must have totally passed out. And that struck me. I passed out? Why did you pass out? Were you drinking? No. I just remember feeling so tired all of a sudden. I couldn't keep my eyes open. And then I woke up around 1.30. The house was quiet. The movie was on pause. Her mother, Jackie, wasn't there. And so she's sitting there on the couch. And she heard this loud boom from upstairs. mother is holding a green bath towel and protruding from the bath towel is a gun. Honey, I need you to stay calm, okay? But what did you do? Honey, I did it for his own good. According to Sarah, she says, you know that Charlie's been in a lot of pain and if anybody asked you, he did it to himself. Now, I need you to take this towel and put it in the basement. Take it. And locks the door behind them and says, now go get the neighbor to force the door open. So I listened to Sarah's story. I said, well, Sarah, I must ask you the obvious question. All right, but this was six months ago. Why are you just bring it to us now? Because I was scared. My mom threatened to kill me if I said anything. But she told him that I'm coming in to tell the truth because I have so much guilt. I can't sleep. I have nightmares about it. Do you have any idea why your mother wanted to kill Charlie? Yeah. She's greedy. She said he had a $49,000 insurance policy, and she wanted that money. And she got it, too. Perhaps in her mother's mind, she had 49,000 reasons to kill Charlie. So, you're going to reopen his case? We're definitely going to look into it and keep in touch. I appreciate you coming in. Thank you. You must take people seriously when they tell you a story. Do you trust what they say? Of course not. Let's explore your story. So my first step is to go to the coroner's office. I inform the coroner of the new development and the coroner agrees to review the report. So I, I looked over all the reports
once again. This is extremely unusual. Indeed. So what do you think? Well, I did notice one thing. The witnesses claimed that Mr. Tuttle had been drinking heavily. But that's not what we're seeing in his toxicology results. The blood alcohol content of Charlie was 0.01. That is not even legally impaired, let alone drunk. That is strange. Well, after looking through everything, uh, are you still confident it's suicide? You know, there's nothing in the report that contradicts suicide. But it is odd that he shot himself in the back of the head. That's yeah, very uncommon. I vaguely remember there was something else I found fishy, but that was like 40 autopsies ago. I don't remember now. I'll uh, read through my notes again and see if I can figure out what it is. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks, Doc. With the coroner's report inconclusive, Kenda's gut tells him to keep digging. Mr. Wayne, I'm Sergeant Kenda. Thanks for meeting me. Glad to help however I can. So Joe took an unusual step, and that was to contact the funeral director who embalmed the body of Charlie. He said, well, in my experience, I've seen over 100 gunshot wounds to the head from people who killed themselves. There was something that just wasn't quite right about this one. I actually remember it quite well. Let's see what we got here. What was the cause of death? Suicide. Gunshot to the back of the head. Hmm. Really? Well, to get a 90 degree contact, you're up, you're down, you're this way, that way, left and right. The result is the entrance wound itself is not round. It's shaped differently. And when I looked at the hole on the inside of the skull, it was much larger, but still symmetrical. Most of the time, you don't get a perfect 90 degree angle. He said, at that point in time, I was suspicious that this was in fact not a suicide, but he went on with the embalming anyway. There's not much that surprises me in this business, but this one did. Yeah, well, thank you. You've been very helpful. So this evidence is adding up nicely to murder and not suicide. And with that, we decided to reopen the case. Ken and his team start by tracking down Charlie Tuttle's widow at her new home. So we want to go see Jackie now because I've got a lot more information other than just Sarah's allegations. I know the physical evidence says that Charlie didn't shoot himself. Do you guys take anything in your coffee? No, just black knife. Um, I wouldn't mind some sugar if that's okay. Sure. The first thing we notice is very sparse. Very little furniture, very neat, very clean. Where all the family photos? There are no pictures of her husband. Almost sterile, if you will. It is very odd to have a personal home that contains no evidence of memorabilia of your family. So there's something already quite odd about Jackie. So, what do you guys want to talk about? Well, your daughter Sarah stopped in the prison. She did? Why? We tell her. Your daughter came to report that you killed your husband and swore her to secrecy. She's lying. It's an absolute lie. Now, Mrs. Tuttle, why would your daughter make up a story like that? It's obvious. She wants more money. And we looked at her and we said, excuse me, what do you mean by more money? suicide of Charlie Tuttle, which has now become a homicide based on the physical evidence and based on the fact that the daughter accuses the mother of having committed this murder. And Jackie tells Joe, oh, she's lying. She only wants more money. Well, more money, what does that mean? I guess the trouble started with Sarah when Charlie passed away. She said there was a life insurance policy that was worth $49,000. I received the $49,000. I felt duty college student had no money. I gave her 10 grand to finish school. I wanted to help her. I wanted her to get on her own two feet for once. Sarah was the kind of kid where she never really had to go out and earn a living. You know, I guess my daughter's a bit of a sponge. So what's all this have to do with Sarah saying you killed your husband? 
Like I said, she wanted more Charlie's insurance money. Jackie tells Joe that she burns through that $10,000 just in a few months. And she's already back asking for more with her handout. So she was threatening for the money? No, she wasn't threatening. She was just acting weird questions about the insurance policy. Like what? She said, Sarah's been talking a lot about the insurance and who the beneficiary actually was. Jackie felt that that was somewhat suspicious. She says, I'm sure that Sarah believes if I get arrested for this and I go to prison, she'll wind up with the rest of the money. While Kenda knows that life insurance payouts don't work that way, it's entirely possible that Sarah doesn't. Thanks for talking to us. Thanks for the coffee. Sure. You know, I hope this gets sorted out quickly, and I'm really sorry my daughter dragged you into this. We'll let ourselves out. If we decide we're leaving, we have no intention of arresting Jackie at this point. Well, that was interesting. It sure was. And all the way back to the car, looking at each other, like, how did we get involved in this? Can we get time? Can you look at the Tuttle's insurance policy? Yeah, we'll do. In the meantime, I'm going to find out more about Jackie and Sarah. Good idea. I mean, even if Sarah is as greedy as Jackie says, would she really do that to her mom? Right. It's incredible. Can you fight a family like this in a situation like this six months after the event? So how do you decide that the daughter is so vindictive and so evil that she will try to put her mother in prison over something her mother didn't do? How does that work? Well, I don't know because I'm not crazy. Jackie and Sarah's relationship. Barbara? Kenda's team tracks down someone close to the family. We discover a mutual friend whose name is Barbara Levitt. I'm Detective Kenda. What can I do for you, Detective? Uh, so you're friends with Jackie Tuttle? Yeah, I know Jackie. I've known her since 11th grade. Back when we lived in Texas. Almost 25 years. I didn't think I was that old. I'm sure Fly stole it. Do you know our daughters? Oh, yeah. I've known Jennifer and Sarah since they were born. So we have not just a friend, but a really good friend who should have... Jackie met Charlie in Texas. She was still married to Edward. She was living in a very contentious relationship with her husband. Wanted out of that. And she felt Charlie would be her way out. So Jackie divorced Edward and married Charlie. According to Barbara... Jackie followed her new husband all the way to Colorado Springs. So what happened with the girls? Uh, Sarah and uh, Jennifer, right? Those poor girls. They ended up going and staying with their dad. I mean, Sarah took it the hardest. She was only three or four. She just didn't understand. Barbara indicated that Sarah has resented her mother her entire life. You know, here's somebody that's supposed to love you more than anything, and here she is not only leaving the family, but moving far away. She's basically abandoning you. I think that's why Sarah's been a little bit of a troublemaker. What do you mean? You know, psychology. Sarah's childhood's warped her mind. She was always around conflict. You know, first her parents, then Jackie and Charlie. Really? What'd they fight about? Well, they fought about money. A lot of couples fight about money. And I don't mean to speak ill of the dead, but... She said, well, I knew that Charlie was having... Sir. Yeah, he had a girlfriend. Jackie was devastated. So Jackie leaves her husband and her two children for the love of her life. And now the love of her life has a girlfriend. Now that's a motive for murder. investigation of the death of Charlie Tuttle, we've come a long way. And now we learn that there is an affair involved, which really puts the emotions on edge. They had some pretty bad arguments over this woman. Charlie swore he wasn't cheating on her. Why did Jackie think she said an affair? She had found 
some notes between Charlie and this woman called Betsy. And so Jackie was convinced that he was going to leave her for Betsy. Is this something that could push somebody over their edge to, to commit murder? Do you believe this? We've got to find somebody else that may know about that. And we determined that Charlie had a best friend. And we want to know... Sir, I'm Sergeant Kendall. We talked on the phone. Do you mind fast two questions? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Charlie and I worked together for nearly seven years at the power station. He was an excellent mentor to me. Can you tell me about Charlie? He was very generous, uh, very outgoing, real outdoorsman. His passion was fishing. He really studied the subject, and he was he was good at it. I also heard he was in a bad accident. Uh, was he depressed about that? No, no, I don't think so. He's depressed about his marriage. We were close enough where we shared very personal information, and so I know that Jackie and Charlie were having difficulties in their relationship. Was Charlie planning on leaving her? Yeah, he was just trying to figure out how to get his retirement funds out first. I'm not sure if these were exactly Charlie's words, but the message was that I have had it, I'm just taking my dog, my guns, and I'm going to Alaska. Alaska? Mm -hmm. Was he going with someone? No, Charlie just wanted to be alone. We say, well, you, we hear a story that maybe Charlie was having an affair with some woman named Betsy. <laughs> no way, man. He wasn't having an affair with Betsy. Charlie and Betsy were friends. There was certainly no sexual relationship. Charlie never did anything except work and fish. Charlie, as a matter of fact, had told Jackie that he was just fed up with her and he was going to move out and divorce her. Just because he wanted away from Jackie. Well, I appreciate the help. Absolutely. So what do we do now? Charlie was apparently planning on leaving his wife and taking his money and going to Alaska. Instead, he winds up with a bullet in his head. All signs point to Jackie. What we need now is the proof. Kenta decides it's time to go back to the very beginning. I want to talk to the first person who entered that home after the shooting. Sergeant Eric Fulmer Garcia. Come on, have The neighbor who kicked down Charlie's door. Thanks for coming in. Sure. What can I help you with? Can you walk me through what happened the night Charlie Tuttle died? Okay. Well, I was sleeping and Sarah came over and woke me up. And she said Charlie hurt himself. I was in a fog of sleep, you know, waking up. I was like, what? What? Basically, she just wanted me to come over and check it out. He goes with her over to the house. Jackie's on her knees in the hallway, crying hysterically. He tries the door. It is, in fact, locked. <laughs> I think she encouraged me. Can you break it in? I said, okay. Charlie! Stay here. Stay here. Stay back. Stay back. At that point, Charlie, I smelled gun smoke. I could visually see a haze in the room. And then I saw the blood and the gun. My mind's eye, I can glimpse the metal of the gun, his head, and the blood. I've got some crime scene photos. Would you mind taking a look at them? Yeah, sure. No, this is not what I saw. That's not the way I found it. It was different in the photo than how I came upon the scene. I entered the bedroom. You tell that there was somebody in the bed. Charlie! But the comforter was pulled all the way up. Charlie. Now, if you're going to shoot yourself, would you hide under a blanket to do it? No. But if you kill somebody and you don't want to look at them when they're dead and feel the guilt, you cover them up. Well, my, my, my. That's important. Even with Eric Fillmore's statement, Kenda's case against Jackie Tuttle is weak. As he's pondering how to strengthen it, a possible solution surfaces. Hey, Sarge, remember when you told me to check into uh, Charlie's insurance policy? Mm -hmm. You're going to like this. We confirmed that Jackie did receive $49,000 from the insurance company, paid her daughter Sarah $10,000, and they have bank deposits into Sarah's account of ten grand. But Jackie ever told us that. Yeah, but you know what's strange is her other daughter, Jennifer, didn't get a penny. Hmm. Why would the mother give money to one daughter, not the other? Were you buying her silence for your $10,000 investment? 
That's a reasonable conclusion. You know where Sarah currently lives? Yeah, I get your address. Thanks. So we go to find her, and we find that she's living with her grandmother, Debbie. Thank you. Can I get you anything else? I know, thank you. So, Sarah, the one thing that's been bothering us is why would your mother give you money for the life insurance and not your sister? And Sarah was dumbstruck that we knew that. She just looked at us. She had nothing to say. Nothing. I think it was to keep Sarah's mouth shut. Creamy. What, what do you mean with that? Debbie went on to say that the day before the shooting took place, she'd gotten a phone call from Jackie. Hello? Hey, Mom. Are you busy? No, I just got home from work. What's going on? Debbie is a nurse, and her daughter Jackie wanted to know if she combined a sleeping agent called Restoril with alcohol, would that make somebody really sleepy? Would it make them fall very, very soundly asleep? Oh, uh, yeah, but you really shouldn't mix those. Why are you asking? I'm just curious. Actually, Mom, later. It was a very, very odd phone call. And when she made that comment to me, I'm thinking back to the story about the family dinner. I just remember feeling so tired all of a sudden. I couldn't keep my eyes open. That Charlie didn't eat the cocktail sauce because he thought it tasted funny. In a beautiful way. On July 22nd, 1990, Kendall wonders, did Jack mix Restoral into the cocktail sauce in order to put her victim and the potential eyewitness into a deep sleep? But does Jackie have access to that drug? Charlie's doctor prescribed it for him after his car accident to help him fall asleep easier. Jackie, you thought you were going to walk, but you're not. Because we're going to walk over to your house and take you to jail. After this long, prolonged investigation, all the information that we have learned adds up circumstantially to the guilt of Jackie Tuttle. We're going to place her in custody for the death of her husband. Over the next couple hours, Kendall and his team hit the streets. They do find Jackie about 11.30 that night in a local water and hole. Charles Tuttle. <laughs> you can't be serious. Come with me. Sarah is lying. She just wants the money. And I looked at her and I said, well, Jackie, you have a problem. Well, she wasn't the only one telling us that. But I didn't do it. That's not what the evidence says. So we're going to take you in front of a jury of your peers and let them decide about your future. Come with us. And Jackie got real silent and looked at Joe and said, I want to she was in, taking them to custody, taking them to county jail and book. Even without a confession, Kenda believes he knows what transpired. In my opinion, based on what I've learned, I think that Jackie knew her husband was going to leave her. Kenda theorizes that at that point, Jackie hatched a plan to stage her husband a nurse how to devise some sort of drug to make him fall asleep. But she also needed to drug her daughter so that she wouldn't be able to interfere with her plan. This looks great. Mm. Huh. Mm. I think the horseradish went bad. So she served the restaurant in his favorite food, shrimp cocktail. But she didn't realize the drug would leave a weird taste in the sauce. And Charlie didn't eat anything that contained the drug, and that's why his toxicology screens came back negative. However, Sarah finished her portion, and when she passed out on the couch, Jackie decided it was now or never.
Jackie quietly went up to Charlie's room and grabbed a towel and a handgun. To her dismay, Jackie sees that Charlie has fallen asleep on his stomach and realizes it will be suspicious if he shoots himself in the back of the head. Jackie knows if she tries to roll him over, he might wake up. Then how is she going to explain this gun in her hand? And she realizes there is no turning back. And she points the gun at his head. like a suicide. Everything about this crime scene is not a spontaneous thing. She thought about it and carried it out. Jackie Tuttle is charged with first-degree murder. Her daughter, Sarah Reynolds, is not charged with any crime. Unfortunately, you never can predict what's going to happen during a trial. And Jackie's mother took in the court you need proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So now the jury is left with making a decision. Who's lying? Everybody's lying. And they found Jackie not guilty of first degree murder. Charlie went to his grave and nobody paid the price. It's the reality of the court system. You're innocent until you're proven guilty. In my opinion, I don't believe Charlie killed himself. I think it was a wrong decision on their part. I think she got away with killing Charlie. It's just interesting how somebody could be involved in something like that and then go on to live just a, a very normal, carefree life. Hi. Wow. Maybe she has had a really happy life and been able to enjoy all that money that she was so desperate to have. You've often heard it said, the time heals all wounds. Time also heals guilt. People's attitudes, memories, and fearfulness have washed away with time. 